continuing with um, Pastor Tim taught the past couple, well, last month, I should say, in Acts 15, and we're going to go from Acts 15 to Acts 16, verse 10. So we're going to start Acts 15, verse 36 through 16, verse 10. <clears throat> <sighs> yep, fifteen thirty six. All right, if you're there, say whoop the whoop. No, I'm just joking. okay. All right, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Don't say woot woot. All right, Lord, we're going to pray. Lord, <clears throat> um, I come for you, I mean, come to you, um, standing here with my sisters and my brothers in Christ um, to speak your word, Father. <clears throat> and not only to just remind them of your word, Lord, but also to encourage them, to encourage myself, Lord, because I know this comes to me first. Um, Lord, I ask that you would, um, that you would speak through me, give me the words to say, calm my nerves, that I would just trust in you, that you have a word to sh give to your people, um, to us individually and as a church, um, collectively. And Lord, um, Again, we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, our big brother, um, the first to rise from the dead and who is now seated at the right hand of your throne. And he is praying for us constantly. And Lord, we praise you for that one or two or three aspects alone. Um, Lord, help my mind to remain focused on you and your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Yes, sir. Um, I have a question. Yes. So is Jesus the Son of God or God himself? So Jesus is the Son of God, but he is also what he he is also God as as well. So we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So they are three persons in one. And I know that probably confused you all the more, didn't it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody have a better way of explaining it? Nope. Uh, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, yeah, he is God, Father, God, Son, and God, Holy Spirit. So, think about it like this. God the Father is the Son of God. Yes. God the Son is God. Yes. And the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. Yes. So, God the Father is the um, is the all powerful, all great, all God, the creator of the entire earth. God the Son so is it. God in the flesh who came down on earth to die for our sins and to take his own punishment upon himself. God the Holy Spirit is the power that works within us to follow God and to live for Him faithfully. So it's God being involved in every aspect of our life, not only creating us in the big picture, but also being the right next to us. It's kind of like the Father who protects His Son um, by providing for Him and giving Him, but at the same time when the Son is crying at night, He kneels down on His bedside and prays with Him. And then He speaks these words of truth to Him that encourage Him. So it's like God with all that aspect. that help? Okay. I think part of the, the glory of God is that we, being mere mortals, can't fully okay. wrap fully, yeah. what God is. It's really hard to understand the way I always try and look at it, is there's God, the Father, the creator of all things, who created man, but also came down and became man when Mary got pregnant. Usually, man and woman have a baby. Well, God made Mary pregnant with Jesus, who is God in human flesh. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. When, when Jesus died, then the Spirit was was given. So, when people pass, and their spirit, you know, goes to be with Jesus. That's the Jesus Spirit. Basically, that was the giving of the Holy Spirit to mm -hmm. 
So, so in Genesis 1 and 2, we have the creation story, right? And so it's God speaking and God is saying, let us make. And so he's, God says, let us. So he starts to make the earth. He, well, the earth is already made, but it was void. So he made day and night and he makes the plants and the animals. And then in chapter two and three, when it's a creation story and he talks about Adam, he says, let us go and make man in our own image. So we see that God is speaking, but there is a there's a plurality to this when he says, let us go and make. So Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they're all are the same. They are with God in creating the heaven and earth when man is created, when everything is created on earth. And so one of the promises that God gave to Abraham and his people is that I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. So we see that God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, but sin came into the world. Adam and Eve got kicked out, right? So we see that um, God is, you know, if we was to say it, no longer with them. So can God contradict himself and go back on his word? No, he cannot. So God spoke to his people through prophets, through um, the power of his Holy Spirit here and there, following up on his people in the Old Testament. And so, um, but immediately after they disobeyed, God told Adam and Eve and the serpent, the devil, that there is going to come someone who is going to redeem my people back to him, who's going to buy my people back. I want my people back. I want to be back in relationship with them. So we have Christ. Just as everybody has said, Christ comes down. He is God in flesh. Right. And so what does Jesus say before he goes back up to heaven? He says, um, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me and you need to go and make disciples, um, teaching them and baptizing them into the ends of the earth. And Jesus leaves this promise before he goes to heaven. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we see that that same promise that was promised thousands of years beforehand is now Jesus is saying the same thing. Well, Jesus left earth. So again, we have this question, has God or Jesus went back on his word. He's not here, right? So no, he hasn't gone back on his word because he tells him, I am going to leave with you the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit. He is going to be the one who guides and he's the one who teaches you. So now all believers, whenever they come to say, yes, I am going to trust in God. I want God to change my life and take hold of my life. That's when the Holy Spirit comes and he dwells on the inside of us. So God has not gone back on his promise from thousands and thousands of years ago because his Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us. He is still with us. He has not forsaken us. And so when we get to the end of days, so we go all back to Revelation and we read in Revelation, it says God is what Jesus says it in. John 14, God is spirit, right? And we must worship him in spirit and in truth. So when we get to Revelation and we look at the throne, as we had a picture of this past week, is that when we look upon him, we see his glory and his spirit. He is just spirit and glory. He's like, it's described as like these beautiful, like jewels and colors that it's just like, whoa, look at, that's God. So that. It's kind of like if you wanted to break it up, you can, you know, God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy Spirit. Like now they're doing their own thing, you know, in different times, but they have always been together and been a part of each other. I know there was a lot. It's a big Sunday school lesson. And five, right? I'm sweating already. I gotta take this off. Whew. Okay, let's read. We're going to start at verse 36 in chapter 15 of Acts. And I have somebody who's going to read with me. His name is Justice. I got you, Justice. Thank you. <laughs> and after some days, circle after some days, um, Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are. 
Now Barnabas wanted to take John called Mark, but Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to do the work or with them to the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus which is where Barnabas was from, but also it's a, one of the cities that they had stopped and preached the gospel in. But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Sicily, uh, uh, C Cilicia, Cilicia, yeah, and strengthening the churches. Paul came also to Derby and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by brothers in Lystra and Iconium. Um, and in Iconium is where they had the Jewish council, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So the people there at the council spoke well of Timothy. Um, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. Um, isn't that interesting? It's so, so funny. It's like, oh, something's different about you. And that difference is going to just be right here in my face. And I can't get past it. But they all knew that his father was a Greek. A Greek. And as they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and the elders in that were in Jerusalem so he's referring back to the Jerusalem council the decision that they had come to they took they took this news to the church in Derby and in Leicester um, so the churches were strengthened by this news and their faith and they increased in numbers so um, <clears throat> If I'm honest, I've had a hard time with this particular lesson. Um, one, because since Thanksgiving has been, from Thanksgiving up until now, has been like, to me, one emotional roller coaster after the other. Like, my feelings just been on my shoulders everywhere, you know, like, I feel like my heart's been like... You know, like, the whole thing, I'm just like, ugh! And then I'm like, for real, Tim? This is what you leave me with? So you're supposed to do all the 15. But, you know, the Lord knows what he's doing. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And the crazy part is, is that he gave me, he told me about 15 before any of this stuff started happening. So it's like, okay. Lord, you, you want to teach me something. <sighs> anyway, so... One of the things that um, I was trying to think of, like, what can we, like, if I had to summarize what we just read in one sentence, what would it be? And one of the things that I came, that came was that when division, bec um, division becomes multiplication, like, and it's kind of like an oxymoron, like, how do you divide, but then still multiply? You know, that doesn't make sense. Hey. Turn your volume down. <laughs> He's like, what you say, mama? <laughs> um, so, and so we're going to kind of just like pick these um, scriptures apart because how is it possible that division, when something is divided, if I think of division, I'm like, man, we're divided and we're going our separate ways. I don't want nothing to do with you. You don't want nothing to do with me. There's no way there's going to be multiplication in that process. So, um, um, so I want us to turn to, I, had, I told you guys to circle in verse 30, 36, after some days. So if you did not circle it, circle it. And then I want you to turn to Galatians chapter 2. Go eat popcorn. Um, Galatians chapter 2 verse 9. <clears throat> and when you're there just say I'm there Galatians chapter 2 verse 
nine. Wow. And Paul, <laughs> so um, it's no surprise that here, Paul and Barnabas, if we go back to just the beginning of chapter 15, they're at the Jerusalem Council, and the Jerusalem Council is made up of the elders and of the apostles of the church. It will be people that we will say that's leaders. And remember, the Jews were bringing in this false gospel saying, Y'all need to be, y'all, everybody who's Gentile, y'all come in here. The only way you guys can be saved, yes, you can believe in Jesus, but you also need to be circumcised. And so we got, um, so um, the elders said, no, this is not the gospel. This is not sticking with the gospel. So this is the news that was taken to the church um, by Paul and um, Silas. So then we are in Galatians and we get to see all the more how serious, you have a question? Okay, how serious um, the gospel being kept in its true form when taught and when lived out is to Paul. Because in Galatians 1, I'm just going to summarize, he says, But even if we or an angel from heaven should come and preach to you a gospel contrary to the one that has already been preached to you, let him be accursed. And then he repeats the same thing. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you have received, let him be accursed. I am not here seeking the approval of man, because if I was, then I wouldn't be a Christian. What's the point of being a Christian if I'm here trying to get man's approval? So, <clears throat> so here we are in chapter 2 of um, Galatians. And it had been 14 years um, since um, Paul had went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas um, and so we see that there's some things that are happening and so this is what in Acts 15 after some days this is what took place in those after some days this is what took place so Verse 9, and when James and Caiaphas, which is Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived that the grace was given to me, that they gave the, me the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to be circumcised, <clears throat> and they to be circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor and the very thing I was, which was the very thing I was eager to do. Um, verse 11 but Caiaphas came to Antioch. So Antioch is the place where Paul and Barnabas were spent a lot of their time preaching. To, and they, it was a huge church. It kept growing and growing and growing. So Peter comes down. It's like, okay. And Paul says, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For he, before certain men... Um, before a certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, um, when he drew back, when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted um, hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led <coughs> led astray by his by their hypocrisy. So, but when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before all of them, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, because remember, Gentiles were not considered to be unsaved, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? So this, so this happened, this was happening at Antioch's church. Peter, who, remember, Christ was the one who said, Peter, upon you I build my rock. Not making him the Pope of the Catholic Church, but saying, you are going to go out this truth, you're going to go out and you're going to be a part of setting the foundation for the church. You're going to be a part of that. And so we have a leader in the church who comes down and he starts getting all wishy-washy and kissing booty when certain people come in. Okay, not literally, current, not literally. But he... <laughs> Brown nosing, brown nosing, right? So there you go. Um, so he comes down and he was like, you know, I'm he acting this way, but then oh my, uh oh, the leaders from the church come down. Let me act like okay, I'm, I'm holy. So and Paul says, I opposed him to his face 
because he was already condemned, because he was already maligning the gospel. He's making the gospel look bad because one, he's a leader. One, he's the one who has helped um, starting churches. But he was going back and forth with the very party that they had had the big issue with in 15. He was like, what? Anyway, so back to 15, chapter 15 in um, Acts you just need to know that so that we can see what's going on. So, we see that Peter's actions caused, as a leader in the church, caused Barnabas to just slide on in. So, if this is okay, because he's doing it, must be okay, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. <clears throat> that should just speak. We shouldn't even have to go into that part. Um, so, we see that Barnabas had, um, he had also fell into the same way of living. Um, and I, now I'm just going to go through the verse, the verses in, down here and just kind of give, uh, just go through a summary, pick out stuff so we can get to the, what the Lord, the rest of what the Lord wants to say to us. Um, we see that Paul wants to go back. He goes up to Barnabas and he's like, hey, let's go back to all the churches that we planted and let's check on them. Let's see how they're doing. Okay, that's a lot of churches. Because if we go back from 16 to 15 to 14 to 13, that is like six to seven like big cities that were mentioned with churches in them, not the rest of the way that they had stopped. So it's a lot of churches. So we see that Barnabas was like, yes, but let's take John Mark. And Paul's like, I don't think so. And as the scripture says, there is a sharp disagreement, meaning neither one of them were willing to budge. It was like we come to a roadblock. I'm not stepping back. And he's obviously not stepping back. So Barnabas and John Mark, they go to, go to the left or to the left. And Paul takes Silas and they go to the right. Paul and Silas goes ahead and they strengthen the churches in Syria, Cilicia, Derby, and Lystra. Paul notices that in Lystra there is a disciple that he can use and he um, takes him. He knows that he's Jew and he is a Jewish believer, but he also has not been circumcised. Um, <clears throat> and he wants Timothy to go along with him. Um, the churches were strengthened and increased in their faith. Um, they, um, as Paul and Silas and Timothy started to go towards Asia, because that's where they wanted to go preach the gospel, there was a setback. They were like, Holy Spirit was like, nope, you can't go there. So they was like, fine, we'll just go on around here and go to Bithynia. And the Spirit of Jesus Christ came and said, no, you cannot go there. So they bypassed that place and they went and they were in Tross. Tross. And at Tross is where uh, Troas, am I saying it right? Wrong? Okay. Um, and at Troas, um, Paul is where Paul receives the Macedonian call. So that, that, that means that he was called to Macedonia and it's great things that happen in Macedonia. Um, he received the Macedonian call where a guy came in, in his dream and said, hey, we are going to, um, I need you guys to come here to help me. Did we read all the way through that? I don't know if I did. No. Okay. Anyway. I didn't read this. Okay. So, what do we need to know? We need to know about these people in the, the scriptures. The, um, we, what do we need to know about Barnabas? Who is Barnabas? Can anybody remember Barnabas? The encourager? The encourager. No, no, no. Different one. A different one. Yes. He was a preacher. Barnabas is the first. His name, his real name is Joseph. The disciples called him. The disciples called him Barnabas because it means son of encouragement or son of the prophet. Barnabas was the one with the field in chapter 4 who took, all, took the field, he sold the field, took all of the proceeds and set it at the apostles' feet. That is who Barnabas is. So Barnabas was also 
when Paul um, came off the Damascus Road, Barnabas was the first one to go to Paul's defense. So we even see like, this is kind of weird. Why would they have this disagreement when Barnabas had Paul's back when the disciples was like, mm, we don't trust him. He used to kill all the people. We don't trust him. So who, now we're at Paul. Who was Paul? Paul was named, his Greek name was Hebrew name or Greek? Hebrew name was Saul. Um, he was a persecutor of the church. When, when Paul gives his testimony to, in Acts, he says, I tried to kill the people of the Christians and I wanted the church to be destroyed. That was his aim. And we can even see that with people today in ISIS, Muslims who are radicalized, who hate Christians. This is why we should not hope for their death and going to hell because if Christ can change Paul and make him work for him, I mean, he can do the same thing for the people who are persecuting the church. Now, John Mark. John Mark, we all know him as Mark. He is um, a... Oh, sorry. He is... Um, he wrote the Gospel of Mark. He is also... Um, uh, a little wishy-washy. Kind of like, mm, I'm a strong Christian today, but man, if this gets hard, I'm going to go over here. He does not like confrontation. He puts me in the mind of like somebody who's just like, you know what, y'all getting a little bit too radical about Jesus. Let me go over here. So, and, and he even describes himself in the garden when the people came to arrest Jesus in the garden, he says, I'm the one who ran with the towel barely hanging around his waist, fled. And he describes himself as that type of person. And so then we see Timothy, um, and um, who is a Jewish, I mean, who is, who is Jew because his mother is Jewish, but he is a Jewish who had not, a Jew who had not been circumcised which is not uncommon because he did not he was a believer he did not have to be circumcised but there did come a point where we had to do the Jewish reckoning um, so in the Jewish reckoning they're saying okay if you're a Jew for real then you need to prove to me that you're a Jew and how can they prove to him that he's a Jew is that he be circumcised so in order for Paul to take Timothy to the synagogues and for the Jewish people to even listen to him and think that he has anything worthy to say, he had to be circumcised. Hence my question throughout this week. I don't know where I put the question at, but like, how do you know when people circumcise? You just got to go and just be like, oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> anyway hey <laughs> but there is yeah there are people who keep a record yes this person has been circumcised and since Paul was a Jew he was a teacher and well known well respected he circumcised Peter I'm sorry he circumcised Timothy himself which when he went to tell the people would be words. So it's just like if I come, you know, somebody that you trust a lot and you know, like, you know what? I know when they tell me something is true, that is what happened. So, so we, so yeah, anyway. So all of this, we see that there's a disagreement. We see a sharp disagreement where they split their ways. What can we take away from what we have observed about all of these people. Um, <clears throat> and it's, you know, one other thing is that for Paul to, you know, the issue um, having, um, which brought the Jewish council to be, to have this decision made, is was because of circumcision because Titus was not circumcised and they're like he got to be circumcised he's not saved these people are not saved but then we see Paul right away just take Timothy and circumcise him like it's like what that doesn't even make sense right so we're going to look at that and then we're also going to talk about God's will overall so what can we take away from what we have observed in this um, one of the things that we can take away is that Paul and Barnabas were leaders and apostles. An apostle means they apostle. An apostle is one who goes and sets order to things. So a, an apostle, if we had a modern day 
thing would be someone who plants churches and starts churches, make sure everybody, like there's elders, there's leaders in the church, there's good teachers, and then they leave and go start another church. So this, this disagreement or sharp, um, sharp disagreement was Paul, between Paul and Barnabas, um, who both were described as being full. You have a question. Okay, you can ask it. Um, okay, so was he an apostle then? No, the apostleship, the, the reason why the apostle, now we may hear people call themselves apostles, but the apostleship, the office of that, no longer exists because this was the planting of the church of Christ. So this is the church of Jesus Christ being spread. That. You know what I'm saying? Like the beginning. There was no churches before. Now there's churches. Now people can have like a gift, like a gift. Um, I've heard it described. I don't want. Yeah, I don't want to be confusing or go away off the. All you just said was it's starting Yeah, no. Right. No. We all are to be starting churches. We should all be doing that. What? Wow. Yeah. Paul Jesus after the resurrection. Yeah, Paul. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. And the reason why the office of the apostleship is closed because anybody who um, the apostles could only be an apostle if they had saw Jesus. I and been a part of what he was doing. They heard his teaching. They received it from him face to face. So even though Paul was not there with the disciples when Jesus was teaching, he did see him on the Damascus road when he appeared to him and said, why are you persecuting me? So he saw Jesus face to face. So, Barnabas... So then, we would be ambassadors? We are ambassadors. We are ambassadors, but we're not apostles? Right, we are not apostles. Nope. But we all, but in Matthew, in the Great Commission, when Jesus says... Everybody was to go out and teach and disciple. That's all of us. That is not saying, oh, I'm an apostle. The, only, the reason why we had to distinguish because we had false teachers coming and those are the ones who were trusted. So, and we see as Paul goes on later in different gospels and, and Peter, that's like, you can trust him. He's on his way. You can trust him, but don't trust him. But, and don't trust him. You know what I'm saying? Because there's people who were taking the gospel and making their own spin about it. Okay, so we know that Paul was described, and Barnabas was described as one who was faithful, full of the Holy Spirit. And Paul, well, we just know who Paul is. And here we see them in this scripture, in this verse, in this argument. And the first thing I take away from this is like, whew, thank you, Jesus. I don't have to be perfect. You know what I'm saying? I don't have to be that perfect leader who's had everything together. And although I want everything to be together and I do want to look perfect, just be real. I don't have to be that, that way. So, and there's grace. There's grace in that. So we notice that when we're looking at this, that, ooh, wrong sheet. <laughs> so we notice that, um, when Luke is pictured, he's describing what happened between Barnabas and Saul, or Paul and Barnabas. He is not saying whether well, he was right or he was right. Like, he's not taking sides. He's kind of staying, like, in the neutral and saying, this is what happened. And the truth is, is that Christians disagree with Christians every day. Right. There is no church that we can go to and, and all the Christians are harmoniously in agreement every day on one thing or the or another. So just because we learn, we learn from Paul and Barnabas that just because there's a disagreement, it doesn't mean I have to go for your neck. OK, because sometimes I want you to go. I want to go for your neck because I want you on my side. You need to see that I am right. Even when I'm wrong, you need to see that. And we don't see that they are like that. But at the same time, neither one of them are backing out. Neither one of them are backing up. Neither one of them are saying, okay, you're right. Okay, you're good. Neither one of them. And so we can see how, we're going to see how disagreements can serve the body. <clears throat> and 
Just because you disagree with somebody does not mean that I think any less of you or you think any less of me. It should do the very opposite. If I am in a disagreement with my brother or sister in Christ and I'm hearing their argument, I should be all the more just like, man, you are just awesome that God has gave you this conviction and you are standing on it. I should marvel at that versus letting a disagreement come in between us and just be like, oh, you know what? She don't agree with me. Um, one example I think about is my friend Victoria. You guys remember Victoria? Um, her mom, their last child, she had home births and her son was breech. And her water broke 24 hours ago. Okay. And so she was pr she is always prayerful like especially during her labors and stuff she's just writing down scriptures and praying and going through the bible and she was like i and people were like you need to go to the hospital and she's like i am not going to the hospital she just stayed there and just went and i'm and my friend even called me and she was our, our mutual friend said tamika can you believe that you need to tell her and i'm like you know what i don't understand this I don't understand. I know what the medical field says. I don't understand, but she is convinced. You all right? Okay. She is convinced and she has a conviction. She, is ne she needs to stay there. So I just said, I'm just going to support her and I'm going to pray for her. And when you know, Caleb came out, the midwife worked it. She was whatever. And Caleb came out fine. She came out, what? <laughs> Moving the belly. <laughs> Okay, I didn't say the U word. Okay, anyway, but the but he was born safe, and you know, like, and so now I'm looking at her. I'm like, wow, she stood against all the people were saying, you know, because she knew what God had told her to do. Now, if it was another mother, they would be like, yes, I need to go to the hospital because they may have been convinced that they need to go to the hospital. So I just think about. Um, that in that book but um another thing that reason why there's going to be disagreement within the body is because we are diverse okay there's no apple that is the same and if we haven't learned anything yet in the book of acts we should know that the body of christ is made up of people who are diverse who are different who are not like each other so as Tim talked about about unity, so because sometimes we think, man, if we have a group of people, a group of church, and they're different, and they can be diverse not only in their ethnicity but in their money, in um, how they dress, just in culture, period, in the food that they eat that they don't eat. How can there be unity amongst or amidst diversity? Um, and we see in Galatians 3.28, Paul says that there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. So in our congregation, all jokes aside, there is neither black nor white, rich or poor, city slicker or... I wanted to say hick, but I didn't know if that would be offensive, so I didn't say hick. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so oh my goodness okay anyway so <laughs> stop it at the foot of the cross whatever leave me alone so as um as pastor tim hit um, this nail a few times um, one of the things that we that unity in our own way points us to uniformity okay and we already know that just because we're all dressed alike look alike doesn't make us unified right and Bob, this guy named Bob I can't pronounce his last name he says that the church of our Lord and Jesus Christ is one church one body but composed of many members each each whom have their own unique gifts, unique function, and unique contribution to the body. If the church is consistent with its nature and its duty, it must maintain unity 
while promoting and practicing diversity. Unity in diversity is often resisted, even in the church. Too many times, unity is replaced by uniformity. Churches tend toward a denominationalism, which tends to put people of the same culture, the same class, the same gift, and the same theology together. A lot of churches tend to promote this type of unity, uniformity. And I think that's the reason why the lost do not want to come to the church, because they come to the church broken all kinds of ways. They're not, they're not just broken one way. They got chips and everything. They're shaped all um, different kind of ways. But then we as the church want to bring them and make them fit into our cookie cutter Christian way. And that's not unity in the gospel. Not unity in the gospel. So we see that Paul and Barnabas definitely have different personalities. They have different giftings, different thoughts, different, way of, different th ways of doing things. Barnabas is an encourager. So it's not a surprise that he would want to give John Mark a second chance. Paul, on the other hand, dude, you mess with me once, you're not going to mess with me again. You know what I'm saying? So we, we have the different... You know, he has this gift, Barnabas has this gift of prophecy and exhortation and encouragement. Um, he, you know, it's not, it's not surprising he would do that. Paul, on the other hand, was not that type. You, you know, he was a take it or leave it. Either way, um, either way you have it or you don't because ain't nobody got time for messing around. We got to be on this mission and doing it. He shot straight from the hip. Boldness was not an issue for, for Paul. Not an issue. Peter, on the other hand, boldness was an issue. He, we saw in Acts he had to pray for boldness. Um, <clears throat> um, we, um, what was I going to say? Okay, yeah. Um, he was very much lacking, though, Paul was, in patience. And willing to endure or walk with people you know what I'm saying like come on you know he was just like get it together or else you know which is no surprise to why when he saw Timothy who was already a disciple because some some people think that Paul discipled Timothy that's not the case Timothy was already a disciple so he was like come on Silas Silas was the same mind frame come on Timothy you already got it let's do it versus Barnabas who was like I'll give you a second chance. You know, I'll give you a second. It's okay. You can do it. So we have two different people who are together for the gospel, even in their disagreements. This can be as simple as disagreeing. And I'm using Kevin's example because we had this conversation a couple weeks ago. He was like, it could be as simple as, you know what? I just want to come to, come to church. We don't have to sing. Just preach. That's him and Josh. That's what they. That's the conversation they had. Just preach, and then other. Some of us were like, "No, I need to have some type of song, some type of music, to worship." Now, are either one of them wrong? No, it's just that's just who they are. They're different in that way, and so I don't need to look down on them because they don't like worship, or they don't. They could care less for singing, you know, versus the word. Yeah, <laughs> guessing uh yeah right so um both of them are for the gospel she they want to hear the gospel we sing and we sing songs and praise songs for the same reason for the gospel all right all right so we know it's okay to disagree one of the things we need to know put your asterisks by this maturity in christ is being able to disagree and still remain unified So how do we know this? How do we know that diversity works? Diversity works. I don't know what that is. Um, for those of us who are in Christ. That's so interesting. Anyway, so first we know that the conflict between the two did not stop the spread of the gospel. And it actually worked on, worked for them, if Paul and Barnabas would have went the way Paul was thinking, it would have took forever 
to get back to those churches, stop at every city, strengthen every city. And then they probably had more people that were coming to, to Christ. They, they would have been there a long time. But we see that because they split or because they, had, they went their separate ways for the sake of the gospel, the gospel, the church increased. People came, more people came to believe in Christ. Um, we also see um, how Barnabas, um, his second chance giving and his gentleness had an effect on Paul. Paul's letters to the first Corinthians and first Corinthians is like, dude, cut your throat. That's Paul. Second Corinthians, he's like, I'm going to encourage you. Please do this. You know, we see like the effect, like, you know, like, man, maybe that's something I could get from this, this compassion, more compassionate, more merciful guy. Um, we also see in Philippians, which a lot of us like and a lot of us are encouraged by because Paul is very soft and very, not, I don't want to say soft, but very gentle in his encouragement even though he is still strong, like you need to do it. But this is how, you know, he encouraged um, the church at Philippi. We also just see that Paul and Barnabas, they come back together in two more chapters. But really, it was years. But they never, <laughs> in two more chapters, they come back. The relationship between Paul and John Mark, they even come together. Um, and Philip by Lehman, verse 23, it's only one chapter. Paul says, my fellow... Ephorus, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristoc Arist Arist I'm putting it, Demas, and Luke, and my fellow workers, the grace of our Lord and Jesus Christ be with you in spirit. So we already see that when he's writing this letter, Mark is with him. Back again. So we see to the church in Colossae, Paul writes to Arista again, my fellow prisoner greets you, Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning you. Um, you have received instructions for him. Please welcome him. What should like, oh, he, he, he's telling them, welcome him. Versus we say, no, he can't come with us. He's now saying, welcome him. And one of um, my favorite chapters in the Bible, um, 2 Timothy, when Paul is right before he is about to go to his death, he says um, in his final letter before being martyred, do your best to come. He's telling this to Timothy. Do your best to come to me soon for Demas in the love with this is in love with this world. He deserted me along and has gone to Thessalonica. Um, Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dal Dalmatia, and Luke is alone with me. But get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me in ministry. Um, Mark goes on. <clears throat> we learn that as we as we go, as you read through the epistles of Paul and through Acts, that Mark goes, um, goes on to work alongside Peter. And Mark writes the gospel of Mark, which is an account of Peter's teachings of Christ. So Mark, if you read the gospel of Mark, um, all of the gospels sound a little bit different, but Mark's gospel focuses on Jesus' <coughs> servanthood. You know, so you see how like when he's relating to Jesus and he's seeing Jesus and he's seeing how compassionate and how he is a servant to all. And why would that be? Right. Because he had Barnabas, who was an encourager to him and a servant to him. And then he's also taking Peter's account of what has happened with Christ. And we know that Peter denied Christ three times. Right. And was given him what? Another chance. So we also see that Peter says of Mark, um, through Silas, uh, through Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this, <clears throat> that I'm sorry, that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm, the church in Babylon, meaning I'm in this wicked, the church in this wicked place, chosen together with you, sends greetings, and so does my son Mark. <coughs> Greet one another with a kiss of love. So we want we need to know like how does this end? We're not through the book of Acts yet, but how does this end? Like how am I supposed to live this Christian life 
disagreeing with my brother and sister and living with them, how is this supposed to end? And we know that this is supposed to end, and this has ended to their death. To their death. Mark, the wishy-washy guy, died in Alexandria, Egypt, after being dragged by horses through the streets until he was dead. That's the Mark who fled Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas was one of the original 70 disciples that was sent out. He preached in Italy and Cyprus, which is his hometown. He was stoned to death. Paul, we know, was tortured and beheaded by the evil emperor Nero in Rome. And then Luke, who writes the gospel, we know that he was hung by idolatrous priests on an olive tree because of his tremendous teaching. So what say you? What about you? How are you going to end this? Are you going to... Um, <clears throat> are our relationships with one another going to hang on the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or is it going to hang on us? Meaning, am I going to be relating to you? Okay, you know what? Bree, whoever, has made me mad. So am I going to go and be like, I'm not talking to her no more. Or am I going to say, you know what, in light of the gospel, I can forgive her. Or am I going to keep pressing the issue with someone? Or am I going to press it for the gospel? Am I going to stand rolling my eyes and doing my two snap formation? On my, with my hands on my hips for the gospel? Come on now, right? Or am I being lazy? for the gospel. I'm not just like I'm not willing this don't fit in my schedule. I'm not going to do it. Or um do I want my way for the gospel? Like I want my way of loving people, Jesus. I want my way of loving you for the gospel. <clears throat> and again, am I right even though I am wrong for the gospel? Because I know that sounds kind of weird cuz we all know that this is all lies if I say I'm right. And I want my way, and it's for the gospel. We know that that's a lie. But if we are honest, if Tamika is honest, I do that all the time. I want all of us sitting in pretty rows, clean garments. You know, everybody's talking the same way. You know, I can understand what you're saying because, you know, we're all the same. We all are uniform. Instead of having to get to know you and trust you, God forbid, you know, trust you and get to say, oh, my God, you know, and get to know who you are. Um, but, you know, we have this sharp disagreement. And, you know, as we were talking earlier with this man, David, there was an even sharper disagreement before all this happened. And that sharp disagreement started in Genesis when Satan came and he tempted Eve and Eve um, gave her husband the apple of the, from the tree and... They disobey God, and sin came into the world. What a sharp disagreement. We see in the Gospels how Jesus is walking, living his life, and he is not biting back. Like, he is, he is on the cross. He is carrying his cross. And no one, and he, no time does he take it and just whip him with it. I mean, he could. He could have. You know, Chris and I were having a conversation like a few months ago about how Jesus took up his cross and he was spat on. He was kicked. All, all sorts of things. And he kept walking towards his death, not biting back. And even when he hung on the cross and as they stuck him in the side, he could have called angels. He could have called God. He could have just got down. But he didn't back by, um, bite back and retaliate. But yet he made provision on the cross for his mother, for his John, um, the disciple. And it was all for the gospel's sake so that we 
can come to know him as our Lord and Savior and be we're not um, reconciled to God and be in heaven um, with him. And, you know, I have to say that Jesus said, you need to carry your own cross. But what I'm learning is that I am carrying my cross. And so if my sister has hurt me, then you know what? She has hurt me and I'm going to pray for her and I'm going to try to reconcile with her. And all my praying and all my hopes are in Christ. And my hope is that her and God will have a conversation and leave it in his hands. Because guess what? My cross that I have to carry until I die is nowhere near heavy as the cross that Jesus carried. Right? He carried the weight of the sins of the entire world for people who haven't even born yet. So all our, all our grandkids, he's carried their weight. All our great-grandchildren, he's carried their weight. And not only did he carry that, but he also bore the full wrath of God. And I don't have to do that. Not even living here do I have to go and bear the full wrath. I wouldn't even, we wouldn't survive. You know, we couldn't take it. But he bore that. And so, as we take communion, um, and Tim is back there, like, hurry up. As we take communion, <laughs> it's like this. As we uh, take, yeah. <laughs> um, as we take communion, I, I do pray. My prayer is, is if there, if you have an issue or disagreement with a friend, with a sister, a brother in Christ, make it right. Meaning, let it go or deal with it. If you're not going to go and try to reconcile, just let it go. And some things, they're not going to be reconciled, unfortunately. And you have to trust God to give you the wisdom and the discernment on what those things are. But we do have a glorious Savior and um, who came in a babe. He didn't come in a bling-bling manger, but he came in... You know, along with the caca and the sheep and all of them, and it was stinky, and he was laid out. That's who our Savior is.